Hello, and welcome to another episode of Over My Dead Pod. This is your host for today, Kate Carter. I am joined by my two co-hosts, Kylie Colwell and Holly Spear. And we're going to go ahead and jump right into this week's episode. So I'm not going to tell you the name of it. We're just going to go right in. So an hour outside of Boston, there's a town called Fall River in Massachusetts. And in the 1970s, there was a crazy recession where there was gas shortage, just like everywhere else. But Fall River got hit really hard. Factories were closing down. People lost their jobs and buildings became abandoned. This left the main street of Fall River empty. And of course, it led to this crazy city underground, you know, of drugs and sex working so people could flourish. The first victim of the Fall River murders is a 17-year-old runaway. Her name is Doreen Levesque. Doreen had escaped her New Bedford foster home and had traveled to Fall River, turning into sex work to survive. At 17 years old, Doreen's body was found on October 13, 1979, under the bleachers at a local high school. Her wrists had been bound with a fishing line, and she had been stabbed in the head several times. Her face was also beaten so badly that she was completely unrecognizable. One month after Doreen's body was found, a man named Andy Maltese went to the Fall River Police Station. He went there to file a missing persons report for his girlfriend. His girlfriend is a 22-year-old sex worker named Barbara Raposa. Now, Andy tells the police he's scared for her safety and starts to mumble something under his breath about a satanic cult. And he says he has information relating to the murder of this 17-year-old Doreen who was murdered a month prior. So unfortunately, and somewhat fortunately, Andy is a very mentally unstable person. (laughs) He gives off major creep vibes. Um, He's a pedophile, he's a sex sadist, and he's a violent rapist. So when he's questioned by the police, he ends up telling them that there's a satanic cult operating within the Fall River area in the sex worker community. And just remember that all of this is happening during a period in the United States called the satanic panic. The Satanic Panic was a panic that consisted over about 15,000 cases of Satanic ritual abuse that occurred in the U.S. through the 1980s and 1990s. All right, now jumping to another one. Karen Marston. She was a 20-year-old single mother, a drug addict, and a teenage runaway. She was also a sex worker in the area. She came forward to the Fall Rivers Police because she was afraid for her life. She tells the police that the local pimp in the area, Carl Drew, was this ringleader of a satanic cult in Fall River, and that he was responsible for the murder of Doreen. Karen felt as if she knew too much and was too inside in this close-knit circle to remain safe. The police ended up offering her protective custody for her cooperation and turning in information, but she denied it. And you kind of have to remember too, because at first I was like, why would why would you deny police like protection after asking them for help? But she was a drug addict. She was a prostitute. And so her daily life was basically would go against having any police protection, you know, like she wouldn't have been able to live her normal life. So now let's talk about Carol Drew, who was mentioned earlier. The pimp, as I will also call him. He was so-called the ringleader of this supposed satanic cult. He's 25 years old from New Hampshire. Now, Carl had been raised in a small farm, and the story goes that he had a very hard childhood with manual labor and physical abuse. He ends up telling a story later on about his alcoholic father that had tied his ankles up as a child and would lower him down into a well to remove, get this, a cluster of dead rats. So, in addition, Carl was also taught to butcher livestock while living on his family farm. What do you mean, dead rats? Like, to remove His dad would tie his ankles with rope and lower him down into a well so that he could pick up all the dead rats and get them out of the well. Yeah, I'm imagining like the claw machine yes. where you get the stuffed oh. animals out. Yes, okay. and he's just claw. picking up the dead rats to get them out of the well, but like as a child. Okay, continue. Yes, and so Carl was also taught to butcher livestock while living on his family farm. He was given the job of cleaning the farm slaughter pit, 
which mean he had to wade through rotting carcasses to separate the hides and hooves for rendering. And at 14 years old, Carl decided he had enough at the farm and ran away to Fall River. He eventually became a pimp and at some point in his life began practicing Satanism. Now, Carl used his satanic beliefs to terrorize the sex workers that worked for him. He had a felony record, was convicted of assault, weapon possession, and armed robbery. He claimed later on that he was also the son of Satan, which just cracks me up. If you haven't already felt them by now, this is definitely major red flags all over Carl. Um, He made his sex workers participate in animal sacrifices and would tell them the same thing would happen to them if they disobeyed him. So the Fall River Satanic Cult had maybe only up to 10 members, and they were all related in one way or another to the sex trade in the area. In 1979 and 1980, the cult held a bunch of ceremonies deep in the Fall River woods, and during the ceremony, the pimp, Carl, would speak in different voices and languages. And everyone who was there stated, in fact, it was different languages. It wasn't just like gibberish that he was saying. So very odd. The first rituals involved sex and drugs. And then things kind of took a turn for the worse when Carl decided it was time for human sacrifice. So the second victim we briefly talked about, her name was Barbara Raposa. She was 22 years old, another known sex worker in the area, and her body was discovered by a man out walking his dog in the forest. The man was out walking his beagle. The beagle starts to sniff around and is chewing on something in the woods. And the man didn't realize until moments later that it wasn't an animal the dog was chewing on. It was completely unrecognizable human remains. Now, the body of Barbara Raposa, she was laying face down, her hands were bound, and she was kind of on a stone that looked like an altar. And she had been beaten so badly that her skull was crushed and there were stab wounds to her head. So, sound kind of familiar. And then, In 1980, in February, a third victim was found. And you might remember her name from earlier. Her name was Karen Marston. This is the woman that had gone to the police because she was afraid. At the time, they had offered her protection, which she denied. But you have to remember, she was an active sex worker and a drug user. So the police protection would have gone against her daily lifestyle. Now, the 20-year-old single mother apparently had been present at the first murder that had occurred of Doreen, the 17-year-old. When Carl found out that Karen had gone to the police, things took a turn for the worse. When Karen's body was found, it was discovered that her head had been beaten in with a rock, her neck had been snapped in half, and during this time, another satanic cult member, 17-year-old Robin Murphy, stated that Carl had handed her a knife and ordered her to slit Karen's throat. Carl, the pimp, then cut an X into Karen's chest, and he used the blood coming out of Karen to put an X on 17-year-old Robin Murphy's forehead. And then they played around with Karen's decapitated head. Like a ball. Like a sport ball. (laughs) Isn't that just... What? You're in the woods doing a human sacrifice... You brutally kill somebody, you play with their blood, and then you decapitate her head and play around with it. What sport? I'm yeah, assuming what? soccer. Mm-hmm. That's like kind of my guess. Maybe a basketball, mm-hmm. a volley at best. It's all mm-hmm. gruesome. Mm-hmm. It's, it's not good. So they, they played around with her. Well, only Karen's skull was ever found. And the only reason police found it is because at some point, Karen had had x-rays of her head done. She apparently had had sinus issues in the past and went into some sort of doctor's office and they took an x-ray of her skull. And so the police had images to compare to it. That was the only way that her body was ever found. So finally a break comes. The Fall River police wiretapped the pimp Carl's phone, hoping to hear him talk about the murders but it turned out it wasn't his phone that they wiretapped. It was the phone of 17-year-old Robin Murphy, who is actually following under Carl's leadership because, get this, she's an aspiring pimp herself. So the police overhear Robin talking about how Carl wasn't the ringleader, but that she was. Robin Murphy ends up contacting police, 
and offers to testify against that first guy, Andy Maltese, the creep. Remember, he went in worried about his girlfriend. As a witness to the murder of his girlfriend, Barbara Raposa, Robin states that Andy killed Barbara and then went to report her missing. Robin also stated that she was present for the first murder, the 17-year-old Doreen, and that she agreed to turn in as state evidence in the case. She said that she would tell them everything in exchange for a deal where she would be placed in police protective custody and then have immunity from being charged in both murders. So this girl is just something else. She, mm, 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 mm. So the story that Robin gave police is that Andy killed his girlfriend Barbara because he found out she had been cheating on him with another man. Andy is the first one to go to trial and based mostly on the testifying of Robin Murphy, on 1981 in January, he is convicted of the first degree murder of Barbara Raposa and is given a life sentence without the possibility of parole. Later on, he's considered to be a suspect in multiple local rapes that had been dating back to the 70s, but no additional charges were ever brought against him. Andy later on is found to be clinically insane while he's in prison, But get this, they never overturned the verdict and they never gave him a new trial. He ended up dying of cancer in prison in 1988, seven years into his life sentence. So Robin Murphy, the 17 year old and apparent lead of the cult, decides that she's gonna plead to a lesser charge. So she pleads to second degree murder in exchange for her testimony against everyone else and that they're going to keep her immunity deal with her so she wouldn't receive any additional charges in connection with either of the other two murders. So the only murder that Robin is being charged with is the last one of Karen. Robin receives a life sentence for the second degree murder charge with a possibility of parole. She ends up spending 24 years in prison and then is released on June 10th, 2004, but quickly violated her parole and was sent back to prison. She's currently serving her time in a prison in Massachusetts. And in 1984, Robin decides to recant her entire story. She took everything back that she said, blaming the other man. The other man. She, it, she was up for parole in March of 2017, but was denied. And then fun enough, she had another parole hearing just last November 10th, 2022 but was denied again. So currently the board states that they're concerned about Robin's ability to tell the truth when she admitted to the board that she lied under oath previously. Um, at the moment, she's gonna be able to fight for her parole every two years. So we're switching, switching Carl's now, okay? So Carl Davis, he is not related to the previous Carl we talked about, Carl Drew the Pimp. This Carl Davis was linked in connection with the murder of Karen Marstein. He never stood trial for the murder, and the following year, he was arrested for assaulting a woman named Sunny Sparta. In a comment that Carl Drew made, the pimp, on his personal blog while in prison, we'll get back to that, said that Carl Davis beat up the three-month pregnant Sunny Sparta, stabbed her in the head with a knife, only because she had information that implicated him. Carl Davis, the pimp, and the other woman, Robin, and that Carl Drew had nothing to do with this woman. Sonny was too scared to testify. So at this point, it seems that the cult is sacrificing or killing people who are threatening to snitch or have already snitched. Um, For the stabbing itself, Carl Davis only served seven years and is now out and free, while everyone else got life. So let's talk about the first victim, Doreen Levesque. She was murdered and dumped under the school bleachers and her case never went to trial. The district attorney stated that the trial would have cost too much money and would be futile because Carl Drew was already in prison for a life sentence. So what's the point, quote unquote. People still think that the satanic cult ringleader wasn't Carl Drew, but was the 17 year old Robin. According to a blog written by Carl, who is in prison, he is pissed off about his trial and goes down through what happened and how he was mischarged for a crime that he never committed. And remember, this is a guy that is in prison for life with no parole, is the one saying it wasn't me. 
He goes on to say that Robin has a really high IQ, she's incredibly smart and manipulative, and that the attorneys just don't want to admit that they were fooled by a 17-year-old child. So after Robin recanted her entire statement, stating that she had lied about the whole thing, and that stating Carl Drew was never involved, there were three witnesses who all came forward. These witnesses had testified against Carl Drew, stating that they had been pressured by the prosecution to testify, and that they actually wanted to testify for him. In the end, Carl Drew continues to serve his life prison sentence and has no chance of parole for the three satanic cult murders of Doreen, Karen, and Barbara. So to finish off this story, I would like to read you the main post from Carl Drew's online blog from prison. You can find this at carldrewsfight.com. And before I read it, I just want to take a second to say that this post was written by Carl himself and it's in his perspective. So because the Fall River cult murders are now closed, we may never really know who the ringleader was, who committed the horrible murders, and who got away with the crimes. So sit back, bear with me, because this is a long post, but it's very important to hear. Hi, I am Carl Drew, and this is my story. This is called The Justice System, Just Another Mafia. I am a 55-year-old man who has spent half of my life in prison for a crime I did not commit. My name is Carl Drew, and at the time of my first trial, I really believed in the justice system. So much that I requested a speedy trial because I believed as long as I told the truth, I would be set free. Wanting to be freed as soon as possible for a crime I did not commit. No deal offered would persuade me to plead guilty to the horrific crime I'm incarcerated for. I was offered a deal four times by the district attorney before my trial. While I was working on my appeal, I was asked if I would take a second degree plea as my co-defendant Robin Murphy did, but I told them to stick it because I am innocent. I would not accept this as if it was some prize as Robin Murphy did because I had not committed the crime that she did. No deal was acceptable to me. I lived my life any way I could to survive. I was far from an angel and still are, but who feels the shame for all of the feelings I have hurt to get the money I need to survive? But never did I kill anyone or ever think of killing someone. It takes a sick person to kill the people the way those three women were, and it came no surprise to me that Robin Murphy could do such a thing. I chose to hang around with her like the misfits of society like myself. But I never really hung around Robin Murphy as I disliked her from the first time I met her. Robin, as well as Carl Davis, who I'll tell you a little bit later on in this newsletter, were known as Satanists and were proud of this. Robin took what she was doing way too far and on her own killed these three young women. This 17-year-old young woman had been practicing paganism before she was even 10 years old. She would tell the girls who were hanging around that there was a cult and that the members would kill people, but if they paid her a fee, she convinced them to get in the prostitution ring and then be able to protect them by pimping them out. The only one the fee was going to was Robin because her sick mind, she was the cult. She was the leader. It seemed Satan had dug his paws so deep into her that nothing seemed too crazy for her to do anymore. It all started out as one man fight over 25 years ago against the whole Bristol County legal system in Fall River. Even my own court-appointed attorney wasn't on my side. And I know this sounds crazy, but it's true. I had to fight the system for a crime I had nothing to do with whatsoever, with no knowledge of how to do this. My case was dubbed the Fall River Cult Murders, and it has haunted and hurt the families of the victims, as well as so many other people the last 25 years. The case, if you can even call it a legitimate one, will be realized to be nothing but a farce when given all the facts. When you're going through reading this, you should also realize it was put together by a 17-year-old girl named Robin Murphy. She, along with the Bristol County District Attorneys, the judges, and the Massachusetts State Police manipulated all of my witnesses in the whole case from day one. I know the people of all walks of life who have been following this case have seen that the Bristol County legal system has done to me. Still knowing all this, after all my appeals, my evidentiary hearing, and all these years, there's still no justice. I am in life without a possibility of parole. 
Would someone with a lot of money or political pull still be in prison as I am? I think not. This was proven when Carl Davis, who had the same charges as me, slipped out of prison after two years. On this man's first day out of jail, he committed another severe act of harm. He went in directly to Sonny Sparta's home with a dagger in hand and attempted to kill this 103 pound, three month pregnant woman. He pummeled her with his fist and kicked her repeatedly while wearing combat boots. He then plunged the dagger into her head screaming, I know Robin told you it was me, not Carl Drew. Who helped her and I'll kill you before I go back to jail. Sonny's neighbor, John, heard the commotion in the hallway and came out of his apartment to see what was going on. Unbeknownst to him, that he was walking out into the hands of a murderer and he ended up having his hand cut off. For these crimes, while still supposedly awaiting for the trial of the cult murders, Carl Davis received a five to seven year sentence. Sonny Sparta told anyone who would listen that it was Carl Davis and that it was not I who helped Robin Murphy with her crimes. A man with money and political pool fathered Carl Davis, two things of which I had none. So after his prison sentence was up, he walked out of jail as a free man. While the true murderess, Robin Murphy, is out on parole, never having received any psychological treatment that she so desperately needs. If you sit on trial or at a hearing, you will hear the district attorney and the attorney call one another esteemed brothers. When the judge's bench is approached, the lawyer or the district attorney or both may say, can we approach you, your honor? This is all going around while I'm sitting there shackled, barely able to move, and not once was I referred to with any respect. I'm a 50 year old who's innocent of a crime I've spent half of my life in prison for and I should get some respect. But no, I get referred to as the defendant when I've done nothing wrong. Sonny Sparta was taken into a back room of the courthouse and threatened by DAs and my public defender. While screaming at her, telling her that if she said a single word to help me out, she would also be in jail. Sonny has a two-year-old special needs daughter and no family at home, so if she went to jail, her life would be endless. They also threatened with the statement that they would give Carl Davis a plea so good that he would do anything they told him to say. Her only involvement was calling the police because Robin confessed to Sonny that she still felt compelled to killing more young women. Another witness, Leah Johnson, had three prostitution cases pending against her and was threatened for two and a half years for each case against her. They also told her that they would make sure her family was taken away, so what else could she do but testify against me? If anyone is wondering why Robin Murphy picked me to do this, it was all over me slapping her in the face for something she had done to my girlfriend. You're right, I shouldn't have touched her in any way, especially slap her, but taking my life from me is a pretty big price to pay. All over a slap, she started her web of lies. Now, Robin was given complete immunity for the first two murders she committed. She received a second degree murder for the murder of the third girl whose head she brutally severed. The justice system told her that she would need a good story and that this is how the web of lies started to spin. She accused me, someone she hated, and the system was elated with the story she was telling them. I didn't have a chance from the moment they arrested me, yet I believe I had a chance to tell my side the truth and I would be freed. I was aware that when no one has money for a lawyer, you get appointed a public defender. But I wasn't aware of the fact that these public defenders don't have the guts or experience to stand up to the state. They just do as they're told. The justice system is run as the mafia. Think about it. The higher up on the ladder you go, the more connections you make. After 25 long years, I head back to the court for my evidentiary hearing, this time with a lawyer that I trusted. Even he was convinced that the evidence at my hand, I would surely be set free. But here I was, another innocent man getting a chance, but I assumed this time justice would prevail. Even Robin Murphy confessed at her parole hearing that she in fact was lying all along and that she had never seen me do anything wrong. I can see why the district attorney put up such a big fight not to overturn this case, because it means that admitting Robin Murphy at the age of 17 manipulated the entire Bristol County District attorneys and court system. The last thing that the court system want is the family of the victims and everyone to know that they were played by fools by an innocent adolescent teenager. I am truly sorry that if Karen Marston's family sees this and it brings up more bad memories, after all, they've already endured. I just want them to have Karen's memory laid to rest, so I send them my condolences and best wishes for her memory. 
I'd also like to thank my attorney, Michael Cutler, retired police sergeant, Paul Carey, who was the lead detective on my case, Patrice, who assisted Michael Cutler. They worked so diligently on my case and for all just believing in my innocence. None of my ongoing fight for freedom would even be possible without them. Help my story, believe my story. I'm having trouble. I don't know. I think it's hard to believe that a 17 year old would lead a cult, especially with Carl's already the pimp. He already has control over everyone. And if you're like the leader of a cult, you already have to have some sort of level of narcissism. I personally think Carl started it. Mm-hmm. And I think Robin really took it on. Like Carl was like, oh yeah, Satan's fun, prostitution. And then Robin was the one like, let's do human sacrifices. Mm-hmm. She like took it and ran with it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I wonder so why it's... she recanted. Exactly. I wonder, I what's assume... the motive behind that? So I kind of assume in my head, because she recanted years later on, and she's still in prison to this day, you know? like So she mm-hmm. recanted her story and didn't go through any process of getting out. I think she recanted the story so that she could potentially get out sooner, saying like, hey, I wasn't involved, he wasn't involved, I'm so sorry I lied, it was this other guy the whole entire time, you know, help me and help me get out of prison. But now the court system is like, oh, you're a crazy liar, why would we let you out? It backfired. It did, it absolutely backfired. So, and it's a really, a really unfortunate story because I will say I'm very, I'm very into cults and I love cults. And this case was a little bit interesting because I don't know as far as I would call this a cult more than just a social gathering, Um, just because it didn't occur for that long, you know, like it's not ongoing. It wasn't more than just a few years and everyone that was in the cult is now either dead or in prison. So, and they were all kind of tied together to begin with it's not like yes. you know, recruited people right like it wasn't people getting scammed into being in um in the cult so it's interesting but um i hope you guys enjoyed the pictures because robin is one masculine looking girl now she is she went from being arrested with long dark brown hair and now she full on I had to double check that it was her I I was confused by that because I was like who is this man that's her on the Robin side that's is, Robin is Robin like lesbian yes mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. she's Robin. completely changed Robin's got a strong jawline mm-hmm. fizzled Jeez. all right ladies that is the case of the Fall River Satanic Cult <laughs> Do you guys want to go ahead and jump into our overtime session for today? Let's do it. All right. So I'll go first. This is going to be really short and very quick, um, just because there are no updates to this. As of yesterday morning, February 11th, 2023, around 2 a.m., a new story came out, um, and I'm just going to read it to you. Missing North Carolina man found dismembered in concrete barrel behind killer's home. A North Carolina man that has been missing for one month was found dismembered and buried inside a barrel filled with concrete behind his alleged killer's home. Jackie Lamar Bright, who has an extensive rap sheet, was charged with the murder of Michael Bradley Cox after police found damning evidence on his property. Cox, 40 years old, had been missing since December 24th, so the day before Christmas he went missing. Police did not reveal what led them to the property but they had executed a search warrant over the course of two days when they found the 55 pound gallon barrel. That barrel had been hidden inside a heavily wooded area on the land and it was filled with concrete. Police suspected human remains were inside when someone opened the barrel and said, hey, I think there's chicken in here. Why would it be chicken? Yeah, why would there be a barrel full of chicken? A detective's like crime scene unit? Yeah, looking for a body and they think oh chicken? they opened the barrel and they were like hey i think there's chicken in here and someone walked over and said no no those are human remains no no that's what we're looking for what the heck 
I'm sorry. It's not funny, but like that cracked me up. I was like, who? And it's quoted everywhere. Hey, it looks like there's chicken in here. No, no. You know, you know whoever said that is getting just shit on at work every day. <laughs> They're probably fired if they have anything to do with it. Um, so just, I'm not going to read about it anymore, but the um, killer is an African-American male older. The victim is an, is a Caucasian male older. Now, the African-American male who is suspected to be the killer had the body in the barrel, blah, blah, blah. His rap sheet, you guys, I was reading this to my husband Cameron yesterday. He had gotten out of prison last year in May, okay? He got out of prison. He had two arrests since, since then, never got sent back to prison, even though he was on parole. He assaulted a woman in December, and then boom, kidnaps a guy at the end of December and kills him. So this is a very big case for everyone listening of how the justice system doesn't work. Sometimes there most likely this man should have always stayed in prison. If you're Mm -hmm. on parole and you violate your parole, not once, twice, you are supposed to go back to prison. That's how that works. Even if you get a speeding ticket, you're supposed to go back. And he didn't. They didn't make him go back to prison. And then he brutally murders somebody. Yeah. So I will keep you guys updated if I hear anything. Obviously, at the moment, he hasn't been char- he's been charged. He hasn't been convicted. Um, this just happened yesterday morning. So I'll keep you guys updated. But um, it wasn't chicken. It's human remains. That's my quote for today. Wasn't chicken. A lot of people are about to be in trouble. All right. Who's next? I have a personal one. A personal crime. What? Against me. Oh. Okay. What? Are you adopted? (laughs) No. I would not be. Um, Kate made these beautiful business cards for our podcast. Oh, no. Oh, no. Beautiful. And um, if you look on it on the back, my name is spelled wrong. No, it's not. (gasps) Oh! It is. Oh my God! I said cow. Yes. I showed them to my dad when he straight to jail. Straight to, straight to jail. No, I showed them. You mailed them, and I showed them to my dad, and I was like, "Oh, look how cute these are." And my dad goes, "Your name spelled wrong." And I thought he was joking because, like, I didn't even notice it. I have never in my <laughs> life spelled your name. I always make fun of people who spell your name wrong, yeah, and I have what? never. <laughs> I've never the other day. all the time all the time I'm like yeah she's not a cow it's a coal mm-hmm. oh my god okay no it's so straight funny to jail. Straight, to straight to jail straight to jail yeah you do the, do the crime you do the time life with no possibility of parole <laughs> I actually spelled my name wrong on my law school applications and I had to come back dude I don't know why like that's just <laughs> it's such an easy last name but yet it yeah. gets mixed up all the time wow <laughs> So yeah. I, mean, I do actually, I have an actual overtime, but, um, Whew. Kate's in trouble. It's in trouble. Okay. So my overtime story is out of Germany. Um, mm. this happened a while ago in August, but like they're releasing more information. So on August 16th, 2022, um, parents of an Instagram influencer reported their daughter Missy. And a few days later they found her body in her trunk. She was like stabbed multiple times, like face disfigured. Parents identified the body. Police are like, yeah, I mean, it's her. She was the only missing person. It's in her car. They went to the autopsy and DNA showed it was not her. What? Turns out the missing girl was, you know, shacked up at her boyfriend's apartment and had been searching online for a lookalike she befriended this woman, originally from Algeria, living in Germany, befriended her, planned to hang out. They met up. She killed the girl to fake her own death and what? stuffed her in her trunk. And this is, you said an influencer. Yeah, like a beauty blogger. Oh my God. That is like, that's shit that only happens in movies. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So like in Germany, they don't release the names of any defendants or victims until like after the trial i did find names and pictures but i i'm not going to say them because it hasn't been confirmed 
Mm -hmm. don't know who it is. But if it is, these two women do look like twins. Wow. She like searched and searched. Yeah. And so nuts. That is crazy. I assume her boyfriend probably had to do with it too. Yeah, he's also been charged. Yeah, I assume it was a together thing. Mm-hmm. That is crazy. Who would do that? That's just, that is absolutely nuts. I just want to know why. Like, what's the, why was she trying to run away from? I don't know. Crazy. It's so hard. That's a good story, though. What about you, Holly? What you got? Okay, so as we all remember, the Gabby Petito case, um, mm-hmm. the case that just flooded everyone's um social medias and timelines we know that the family is now suing and they are suing obviously not brian laundry since he you know is deceased is deceased but they're suing his estate they're also suing his parents and they're suing the moab police department i think that one of the suits settled maybe between the estate of Petito and Laundry for $3 million uh, last year in November, but the other two are still ongoing. And in these cases, Petito's lawyers have released a selfie that was taken by Gabby. And this was almost immediately before police stopped Brian and Gabby. And this was like the whole infamous recording. Fire buddy, yeah. Yeah. yeah the police stopping them in their van and taking her out and cry- she was crying and all of this. So I think they're probably using this as evidence to say like, oh, you didn't see like any evidence of abuse on her face or anything. And um, I think Kylie said, you've seen it, right, Kylie? Yeah. Hey, she has like a black it. guy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's, oh my gosh, the picture is so sad. You can tell she's been crying. You can tell, I mean, the, I don't understand how police could not see that on her face. I mean, I didn't see it in the video, but I mean, that was like the, um, the video they released was the uh, camera footage, the, what is it called? The body, the body cam body cam footage from the police. So, I mean, I'm sure they could see a lot more detail than we could, but I don't know how you wouldn't see something like this if this was taken a few minutes before they were pulled over. But um, it's really sad, obviously shows evidence of abuse. So I think this is probably being used in the case against the police. Gabby's family is suing for $50 million. And the money will go to the Gabby Petito Foundation, which is dedicated to locating missing people and domestic violence. You know what I'm what I'm very curious about in this case of what's going to end up happening is with Brian Laundrie's parents, yeah. because there was so many things that occurred where they could have potentially been involved once Brian went missing and ended up killing himself. It, you know, there was a lot of insight that they were they knew and were helping him and not to mention either his mom or his dad I can't remember which one was a former FBI agent um and so in this case you know they didn't speak at all they were you guys remember like they went into the lawyer's office with a bag full of stuff and then they came out with the bag empty yeah and that Mm -hmm. Mountain Dew bottle was found near Brian's body and it's just a whole I'm very interesting to see how that will play out um yeah parent perspective that's must that has to be a really interesting thing to have to go through is you know you're just saying if this did happen like your son comes home and says hey I killed my girlfriend I'm gonna go try to run away and kill myself and like you either have to turn him in or help him you know like that's your son so very interested in that very interesting yeah Thanks for tuning in for another episode of Over My Dead Pod. If you want even more information about the case that you just heard, including photos, videos, and sources, check out OverMyDeadPod.com. And don't forget to leave a review and subscribe wherever you're listening to this. And we will see you all next week with another case. Bye. 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 Bye.